Premier Zhao, ladies and gentlemen, Nancy and I are delighted to welcome you here tonight. We hope to return it in at least a small way the kind hospitality that has been extended to us since we first set foot in this magnificent city. For Americans, Mr. Premier, the very mention of China holds a sense of allure. It conjures up images of the Yangtze River, alive with traditional Fanchuan and modern steamers, with the wide deserts of the north, of the bamboo forests in the southwest that are home to pandas, golden monkeys, and so many other animals native only to China, of the rich, productive fields and farmlands of the east, and of the huge cities like Beijing and Shanghai. All these provide a sharp contrast with America and remind us of China's sweep and vitality. Yet what strikes us most, perhaps, is the sense of China's history. Chinese records date back 3,500 years. Kingdoms rose and fell in China long before we in the West saw the rise and fall of Rome. And your people were creating and building architectural wonders more than a thousand years before Christopher Columbus discovered America. By contrast, Mr. Premier, it was barely four centuries ago that the first European settlers landed on our eastern coast. These hardy men and women, and those who followed them, came from virtually every nation in Europe. They felled trees, planted crops, built towns, and established legislatures. Later, many thousands came from China and joined the pioneers who were establishing farms and towns in the American West. I have to interject here and think, if they had only come earlier, and the earliest had come from across the Pacific instead of the Atlantic, the capital would now be in California. <laughs> but together, these diverse peoples build a great and free nation. Today, that nation represents a powerful force for peace in the world and is leading a technological revolution that ranges from tiny microchips to voyages through the vastness of space. Our national experience has instilled in all Americans certain fundamental beliefs. It has taught us that for a nation to prosper, there must be peace, and that for men and women to work together, they must respect each other's rights. And just as these beliefs guide our dealings with one another, They've guided us from the first in our dealings with other nations. Just over a century ago, Ulysses S. Grant, then a former president, came to China and described America's foreign policy goals to the Chinese leaders of that time. We believe, he said, that fair play, consideration for the rights of others, and respect for international law will always command the respect of nations and lead to peace. I know of no other consideration that enters into our foreign relations. Well, the policy that President Grant described then remains our policy now. For nearly four decades, the United States and her allies have kept the peace in Europe. Throughout the world, the United States is supporting the causes of national self-determination and economic progress. And in the interest of peace for our children and our children's children, we're working to achieve an equitable and balanced reduction of nuclear arms. Our aims and commitments are fully consistent with the sovereignty, independence, and economic development of all nations, including China. We seek no expansion but the expansion of goodwill and opportunity, no victory but the victory of peace. China and the United States, Mr. Premier, differ markedly in their values, forms of government, and economic systems. To ignore or understate our differences would be to do an injustice to both. But we both believe that despite our differences, our people are united in their desire to resist foreign threats, raise their families in prosperity and peace, and go as far in this life as their intelligence and imagination might take them. We hold more than enough in common to provide firm ground on which we can work together
for the benefit of both. In the 12 years since the long silence between our nations was broken by the signing of the Shanghai Communique, China and America have begun a productive partnership. Our cooperation has helped to provide a counterbalance to aggressive world forces. In recent years, we have formed new and important bonds in other fields as well, expanding our cultural and academic exchanges. One figure tells a big part of the story. Just five years ago, there were no more than a handful of Chinese and Americans studying in each other's countries. Since then, several hundred American scholars have come to China, and more than 10,000 Chinese students have gone to America. These students are forming the ties of friendship and understanding on which the future of our relationship depends. At the same time, our two nations have begun economic exchanges that are growing in importance every day. Today, China exports tons of foodstuffs, raw materials, and manufactured goods to the United States each year. America, in turn, supplies China with grain, transportation equipment, and scientific instruments, and the United States is helping China to acquire the capital and technology so vital to a growing economy. Already, some of the many joint Chinese-American business ventures have begun to bear fruit. This magnificent hotel is the outcome of just such a joint venture. As our relationship has matured, Mr. Premier, both our nations have undergone important changes. In the past 12 years, we in the United States have had four presidential administrations. Each has worked steadfastly to improve the Chinese-American friendship. Here in China, you too have had changes in leadership, but you too have remained firmly committed to the friendship between our nations. We in the United States are particularly pleased by the new emphasis on economic development. We congratulate you, Mr. Premier, and the other Chinese leaders who have worked so diligently and boldly to improve the lives of the Chinese people. We recognize that it took courage to set these policies in place, and you have our pledge to give you our full cooperation as you modernize your nation's economy. To view China and the United States as immense lands a world apart is to see one aspect of the truth. But in this century, there's another view that is even more meaningful. It is the view of a small green and blue ball spinning in the darkness of space, a sight that has so deeply moved all who have seen it. That view is a view of the future, for it shows one planet, our planet, where all nations seem as close neighbors. Our two nations, Mr. Premier, are firmly committed to that future. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a toast to your health, Mr. Premier, to the health of President Lee, General Secretary Hu, Chairman Deng, and the other Chinese leaders I've been privileged to meet, and to the everlasting friendship of the Chinese and American people. And if I say the final word that I was going to say with the glass that I will hold in my hand, <clears throat> I'm afraid we can't do it. I was going to say, Gambe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank 他在痛念时期就已听说有关中国的情况, 但那时, 
，中国好强，远在一百万英里之外。今天，现代化的交通工具已大大缩短了中美两国在地理上的距离。请允许我就此再加上一句：维护世界和平和造福两国人民的共同利益，利益又要求我们双方。越过社会制度和意识形态的差异，努力寻求扩大平等互利的合作。本着这一愿望，火药帮总书记邓小平主任、李先年主席、与总统先生和其他美国贵宾进行了友好的会晤。我和总统先生也在坦诚友好的气氛中进行了建设性的、内容广泛的会谈。双方都表示应该严格按照历次中美联合公报所阐阐明的原则，进一步发展中美关系。都认为，经济技术合作方面存在着巨大的潜力，应该积极加以发掘和应用。中美两国政府还将签署避免双重征税协议、和文化交流执行计划以及几个议定。朝鲜和平利用海能协定，总统先生这次访问再次表明，开诚布公的对话是沟通我们之间的桥梁，有助于双方继续探索、增加相互信任的途径，以争取建立稳定持久的关系。经济贸易来往往来是联系中美两国的一条重要纽带，建交五年多来。由于双方互有需要，中美之间的经济贸易得到了迅速的发展。正如李根总统在一次讲话中所说：“这一情况使我们对今天感到高兴，对明天感到乐观。”从一九八六年起，中国将开始执行第七个五年计划，逐渐扩大建设规模，这又将为中美经济合作开辟新的前景。对外开放政策是我国的一项基本过程，在对外交往中，我们坚持平等互利的原则，在两个社会制度不同的主权国家之间，友好相处的关键在于相互尊重、相互照顾、平等协商。十九世纪，美国著名诗人艾默森有一句名言：“交友之道，在于以友待人。”我们希望。中美经济贸易关系能在健康的基础上不断取得进展。李根总统和夫人以及其他美国贵宾明天就要到外地参观访问了，我预祝他们旅途愉快，并请大家和我一起为他们的健康干杯。